This is going to be a video about Earth's waters. Uh, all the water on the Earth is called the hydrosphere. The hydrosphere. That would include all the water that we would find in the oceans and rivers and lakes, even underground in what we call groundwater, and even in the atmosphere. And remember that water covers 75% of the Earth's surface. We use water day in and day out. In fact, this is a site that a lot of us can see, especially in the summertime down here in Georgia, where farmers are using these giant irrigation systems to water their crops. Fortunately, this summer we've got a lot of rain, but we still use an incredible amount of water to water these crops through irrigation. Now here's a question for you. Where does the water come from for this process? Where does all the water come from that these giant irrigation systems are spreading out on the crops every day? Think about it. Scientists today believe that a lot of the water on Earth was formed as the Earth itself was cooling and turning into a planet. But there's also some discussion and belief that some of the water was brought to Earth by comets as they came crashing into the Earth again billions of years ago. This chart gives us kind of an idea about the water on Earth, how it's broken down, uh, where it is, how much of it there is. As you look at the chart, you can see that 97% of all the water on Earth is salty. Now, we can't drink salt water. Only 3% is fresh water. 3%. Another way to think of that is, if we had 100 bottles of water, 100 soda pop bottles, if that was all the water in the world, 97 of those bottles would be filled up with salt water. We couldn't use them. Only three bottles would have fresh water, and of those three bottles, two would be frozen solid. So we would actually only get to use one bottle of, of that water. So that's 1%. So of all the water on the earth, we get to use 1%. But of all the fresh water on the earth, we get to use one-third of it. Check out this shrimp boat. Boy, I love some shrimp, and I bet a lot of y'all do too. So our coast has a lot of shrimp because of our shallow waters. But here's a good question for you. What kind of water is found along the coast of Georgia? Okay. Also, which ocean is out there off the coast of Georgia? Think about that for a minute. Oceans and seas. 97% of the Earth's water is found in oceans and seas and even salt lakes. The problem with all this water is it's got too much salt in it. We can't drink it. We can't put it on our plants. Um, it's just good for some animals to live in. Now, there are really five main oceans today, five named oceans. Really, there's only one giant ocean. We could call it the World Ocean because it all is connected together somewhere or another. But we break it down into five regions. The Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean, the Southern Ocean, and the Arctic Ocean. Now, the Arctic Ocean is the part of is it's the very North Pole. The North Pole itself of, uh, itself of the Earth is nothing but ice and salt water. There is no land up there. The Southern Ocean is down below the in the Southern Hemisphere and it goes from the 60th latitude down to the South Pole. It's the water that actually surrounds Antarctica. Do you know which of these five oceans is the largest? Think about it. The cool thing about this slide is, just like looking at a globe, is you can tell if you follow it, you start your finger anywhere in the ocean and you can trace around without having to cross the land. And this just shows us how the ocean is one giant, it's all connected, it's interconnected. And if you look at this map, it shows 60 degrees south latitude. And you can see that water down there between 60 degrees south and Antarctica, that would be the southern ocean. Now, Here's a good question. Can you locate the boundary between the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Indian, and the Southern Oceans down in the Southern Hemisphere? Take a look at that and think about it for a minute.
Some people wonder, well, what's the difference between the ocean and a sea? Well, the ocean, like we said, is the giant ocean of all around the Earth, in the Pacific, Atlantic, the uh, Southern, the Arctic, and the Indian Ocean. Uh, it's all connected. But then they say, well, what's a sea? Isn't it, is it the Atlantic? Isn't it a sea? Well, a sea is actually a smaller piece of the ocean that's kind of landlocked. Look at a map and think about the Mediterranean Sea. The Mediterranean Sea is actually part of the Atlantic Ocean, but because it's almost completely cut off and surrounded by land, we call it a sea. Um, can you think of the name of any other sea? There's quite a few of them in Europe. Seawater is very different from fresh water that we like that we can use. Seawater is always going through the hydrologic cycle. Um, the hydrologic cycle is what we call the water cycle, and we'll discuss that later. But one thing because of the water cycle is there are lots of dissolved solids that are constantly being added to the ocean basin. Now, when we say that word ocean basin, think about a, uh, a wash basin, a, a tub of some sort. The ocean basin is just the, the deep part. If you took all the water out and left the deep hole of the ocean, that would be the ocean basin. So when talking about an ocean basin, we're just talking about the, the part that's filled up with water. So, But there's lots of dissolved solids. What are some things that you can think of that might be being added to the ocean because of rain and stuff? It's kind of a funny question, but think about that. What solids or dissolved materials might be being added to the ocean every single day. Salt water in the ocean, well, it's salty. We have a special word to refer to that, and it's called salinity. Salinity means the saltiness of the ocean. The salinity of ocean water is about 3.5% by mass. 3.5%. Uh, another way to think of that, what that means is, if we had 100 pounds of, of water, I know we usually think of water in gallons, but if we had a big bucket or something and we weighed out 100 pounds of water, if we got all the salt out of that water, we'd have three and a half pounds of salt. I mean, that's like three and a half boxes of salt like we use at home. So that would be th the salinity, 3.5%. Uh, just a couple of quick facts here. The salt in the ocean comes from rocks and soil. As it rains that on rocks and soils on the land, uh, this rainwater dissolves a little bit of the salt out of the land and carries it back into the ocean, and then it leaves it there. Um, and the oceans are always moving, and that's what keeps this saltiness stirred up. This is another slide talking about salinity. Salinity is, again, how much salt we have dissolved in seawater. This is showing us in the metric system that if we had 1,000 grams of seawater, that we would have 35 grams of salt. So in English, again, like I said, 100 pounds of water would give us 3.3.5 pounds of salt. Well, it's about time we talk about fresh water. As we said earlier, only 3% of the Earth's water is fresh water. And two-thirds of that is frozen. Remember what we said about the 100 bottles? 97 bottles would be salty, 3 bottles would be fresh, and two of those would be frozen. Most of the Earth's fresh water is frozen in the polar ice clap caps and glaciers. Polar ice caps and glaciers. So the North Pole, Antarctica is completely covered with ice. Greenland's completely covered in ice. Um, and uh, Iceland and places like this have lots of glaciers. Now, a glacier is a huge chunk of frozen ice uh, that's slowly moving across the land. You could think of it as a river of ice. And in fact, we've all heard of icebergs or seen pictures of icebergs. An iceberg is a piece of a glacier that's broken off and is floating away. Remember, 1% of all the water on Earth is usable by humans. That's all. That's all. The source of fresh water from, on Earth is mostly from precipitation. And I think you guys have studied uh, the water cycle in the past. So you know precipitation is a fancy word for rain. So uh, salt water evaporates, goes up into the sky. Nothing but the sweet water or fresh water goes up into the sky. The salt stays behind the ocean. Uh, this, precip this evaporated water goes up, turns into rain, and the rain comes back to the earth. And so most all of that comes from the ocean. 
Fresh water originally started from the ocean somewhere and came to the ground as precipitation. A lot of the rainfall that we get from precipitation, it can wind up back in the ocean as runoff. But uh, if we're lucky, a lot of this runoff will soak into the ground. And then the ground is where we get the water that we use for the most part. And how much runoff turns into groundwater depends on how much, what kind of soil you have, how wet, how much soil moisture there is, in other words, how wet it is, uh, how much vegetation. You know, if there's no vegetation, if it's just dirt, then the water's going to run off and cause gullies, and that water will wind up going into streams and rivers and get back to the ocean quicker. But if we have some vegetation, or if the land is kind of flat, then the, land, the water gets slowed down, and so it sinks into the ground more. Another thing is the intensity of rainfall. That's how hard is it raining. If it's raining slow, then the water has more time to soak in. But if it's a hard, pounding, pouring rain, we have all this water running across the land everywhere. So uh, a good question is, how do these things affect what happens to the water? Well, I kind of just told you, but I want you to think about it for a second. This is our very own Ogeechee River. This is right over there by the river bridge, y'all. Now, if you look at it, you can see this river is moving very slowly. Uh, and I know a lot of you, some of you have been on the river and you've been fishing, uh, maybe with Grandpa or your dad or mom or somebody. But if you look at this, that water looks kind of brown. Why do you think it's brown? Surface water. Now, we talk about surface water here, we usually talk about fresh water. Uh, just like the Aguichi River. Uh, the Aguichi River is a watershed and all the land around there is, is drained and that water that drains into it uh, is called a watershed. We can have large watersheds like the Aguichi River. We can have smaller watersheds like Buckhead, some of the creeks that run around our areas. Um, what would you call that area, the marshy land all around the Aguichi River? What did we just say that would be called? Okay. Now, even though the earth is covered by water, only a tiny fraction, 0.008%, is contained in rivers and lakes. So even though the, the Geechee looks kind of big, and we got some big ponds, and uh, if you've ever seen the Mississippi River uh, and some of these other giant rivers, uh, they're only a tiny, tiny bit of all the water on earth. And... By now, we've probably already talked about, and you should have seen the demonstration about five gallons of water. A minute ago, we were talking about watershed. If you look at this map, this map shows the watershed for the Geechee River. Okay, see right down through here? This is the Geechee River. And these counties on either side here, the light yellow area, that's where the water is draining, usually goes and drains into the Geechee River. Can you find the Jenkins County on this map? Do you know what it looks like? Where is it? It's right there. There it is right there. Different rivers will have different watersheds and usually uh, there will be an area between those watersheds It's called a divide. Rainfall on one side of the divide will run into one watershed and rainfall on the other side might go into a different or an adjacent watershed. If you've ever heard about the Continental Divide, uh, the Rocky Mountains separates the United States into two parts. You've got the uh, Pacific watershed and then you've got the Eastern watershed. So all the water on the western side of the Rocky Mountains, it's going to drain back down towards the, uh, Atlantic, the Pacific Ocean. And all the rainfall that falls on the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains is going to, if it makes it back to the ocean, it's going to be down to the Gulf of Mexico or into the Atlantic Ocean. Are we east or west of the Rocky Mountains? I'm not sure. Find the map and check it out. Talking about fresh water, uh, here's a few definitions. A small body of standing water might be called a pond. Uh, if it's a little bit bigger, we might call it a lake. Uh, if that big standing body of water is used for a city to get its drinking water from or to try to help stop flooding or to control how high a river is, then we can call it a reservoir. Uh, if you've ever been up to 
Lake Thurman or Clark Hill, the dam up there, there's a huge lake. And Clark Hill Lake is used to control how much water flows down the Savannah River. Um, they actually have a dam, uh, power plant up there, and they make some electricity coming off that water. So maybe a quick, uh, nice trip to go to sometime. Here's a good question for you. Does Millen have a reservoir? Is that where we get our drinking water from? Speaking of Clark Hill, I was standing on the dam when I took this picture. Look how big that lake is, and it is, you know, miles and miles and miles long. I think it's like about 200 feet deep right here, too. Pretty good sized lake. Now, the water that is so important to us down here in Jenkins County is groundwater. Groundwater is where we get our drinking water from. Water from a saturated zone. Now, when we say saturated, if you pick up a sponge out of a bucket and that sponge has just got water running out of it, that would be saturated. So we got places underground where the ground and the soil is actually saturated from infiltration of rainwater. Infiltration is just a fancy word for soaking down. So water soaks down from the surface, from rains and all. It goes down into the soil and rocks. There's little spaces in there uh, between the rocks and soil if it's not very packed too tight. And it's called pores. Uh, when we talk about porosity, think about the holes in a sponge that actually hold that water. So the, the groundwater is soaked into an area of the ground down there that has lots of spaces to hold that water. As we said, when it rains or precipitates, some of that precipitation runs down and may soak into the ground. Uh, it can stay in the stream where it's runoff, or it can soak into the ground and become groundwater. This shows you about the porosity. As we can see, grant, sand and gravel's got lots of spaces in there. Water can move down through it. But then you look down here at the bottom picture and you see clay. We know how hard clay can get. And clay will not let water soak through it. It'll hold it. It'll trap it. So to have a good place for our water to be stored, we need to have lots of sand and gravel particles so the water can fill into it. Over time, groundwater will continue to settle or sink down through the ground. In other words, for that to percolate as it slowly drips and drops on down through the ground until finally it gets to an area where it starts filling up with water. Now, the layer of the water, the level of the water underground is called the water table. Um, the water table, you can tell where the water table is if you go driving through the countryside and you see a stream then, and if you go next to that stream on the land and dig a hole, you're going to get water at the same depth as the, as the top of that stream is a few feet away. So that's the water table. It's how high the water is filled up into the ground. Now what's important to us is an aquifer. An aquifer is an underground area that holds water. If you got very permeable soil, which means you got lots of spaces in it, you can have lots of water. Groundwater that's under pressure because it's, uh, it's under an impermeable layer, we call that an artesian aquifer. Uh, that just means that water is going to be coming back up out of the ground because of the pressure. Everybody here in Jenkins County gets their water from groundwater. Everybody in the county, whether you're in the city or in the country, we get our water from an aquifer. It comes up out of the ground. Usually we have wells. This picture kind of gives us a, a kind of an idea of how the water can move. This would be a permeable area where water can drain down through it. Uh, it gets into this area which has lots of spaces. This is filling up with water. Now this would be the water table. This is the water table. As you can see, there's where the water is sunk down. This is filled with water. Uh, here's a lake that shows you that the water table of the lake is the same height as the water table on the ground. Coming on over here, uh, this is a real low area, so we got water dripping out of the ground called a spring. Or it might form into a river. This could be a watershed, but eventually, eventually all the water that rains from the ocean will eventually work it back down into the ocean itself, which starts the process all over again. Our own Magnolia Springs. What you can see right here, this is the spring, 
And there used to be at one time like 8 million gallons of water a day coming out of here. But that's fresh, cold water coming up out of the ground. In this picture, don't worry so much about the numbers. This is just kind of a, a reminder about the water cycle itself. As we can see, we got evaporation. Evaporation where the water comes up out, water vapor comes up out of the ocean, turns into clouds. The clouds come over here and they rain, precipitation. Precipitation hits the ground. Some of it runs off, it hits the ground and runs up through rivers and stuff and goes back into the ocean. And then some of it, as we said, soaks down to the ground where it turns into groundwater. Some of you might have heard your grandparents or somebody talk about an artesian well. Uh, some of you may be lucky enough to live close to an artesian well. What we got on the area of recharge up here, this is just where the water is coming and soaking into the ground. Uh, we have an aquifer which is filled with water. Um, and as we come on over here, we can see this is our water table, and we've got a low area, so the water pressure actually comes up out of the ground. Another, way, another word for an artesian well, it's, it's kind of a spring, so we've got water being forced up above the ground. Um, does anybody know where an artesian well is close to your home? Of all the fresh water used by humans, most of it, the biggest part of it by far, is used for agriculture, growing crops, growing our food. We use a lot of it for electricity and we use it in manufacturing. I think only like 5% of all the water we use is used in our homes and households. So by far, by far, most of the water, fresh water that we use by humans is for growing our food and to make things that we use. As we said earlier, some cities get some of their drinking water from lakes and even rivers. Well, there's no telling what's in those lakes and rivers. At the very least, fish and frogs, and I don't know about you, but I don't want to drink after those creatures. So all that water has to be purified. It has to be filtered. Uh, it has to be treated with chemicals to kill the bacteria. Um, now, when we get our water out of the ground, it's already been filtered by soaking down through those all that sand and rock. So our water underground is pretty clean, Is but if you get it out of a, a lake or a pond or a river, it's going to have to be purified. Most everybody in Georgia, except uh, around Atlanta uh, and a little bit of Augusta, everybody in Savannah and all these places, we get all of our water from out of the ground. It comes out of well.